If you've ever been in a long standing, intractable, heavy conflict with someone in your life, you know how horrible it is, how debilitating it can feel. And you know the knots we tie ourselves in to not continue the conflict. We avoid, we feel bad about ourselves, we brace, we try to change the subject. Or if you're a blamer, <laughs> you may get triggered again and again and again to point out to the other person how they're contributing to the conflict. And of course, we all have conflicts in our lives. We have conflicts with the people closest to us. We have conflicts at work. There are, you know, political and social conflicts, particularly at this time in my life, more than any time I can imagine and remember. And it's not getting better and we're not getting better at it. And we seem to get stuck in conflict loops, which is the phrase that today's guest, Jen Goldman Wetzler, uses to describe why conflicts are so sticky and why we can get so trapped in them. She's written a wonderful book called Optimal Outcomes, which I hope you'll go get uh, as soon as you listen to this conversation. And she walks us through a process whereby each of us can take responsibility for how we contribute to conflict, which sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like I, I can't blame the other person anymore. I've got it's my fault, but not what she's saying. But by acknowledging that I am contributing, that gives me the power to uncontribute or to change the game a little bit, to be clever and creative and generous and brave and unexpected and to get amazing results, even in conflicts that have been going on and feel like they have a life of their own. So let's get right to it. Without further ado, Jen Goldman Wetzler, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much, Howie. It's great to be with you. Yeah, so we're, we're going to be talking about something that is entirely theoretical to me because it's completely irrelevant to my life, which is conflict. I'm sure you get that all the time. <laughs> yes, of course. It's totally irrelevant to most people's lives today. <laughs> right. So it's just, it's just sort of a theoretical curiosity. <laughs> right. um, no, you, you are the author of the, the book Optimal Outcomes, and... It's a, a phenomenal book um, and it's already helping me a great deal in understanding kind of the ways in which I help perpetuate these conflicts that I feel like in my bones are entirely foisted upon me <laughs> that I had nothing to do with. And, and there's, you know, and under, first understanding that I do have something to do with them. First, it hurts. And then it means that there's something I can do to resolve them. So I just want to I want to thank you for taking the time to to write the book and to share it with us. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to read it and really get what the message is. And I um, what you've just said means a lot. That is, you know, the crux of the book is all about rather than thinking that someone out there caused it and therefore someone out there can take it away. The whole premise of the book is all about what you just said, which is recognizing our own part in it and also recognizing the, the great capacity that we have within ourselves to free ourselves from these situations, even if we haven't completely caused them, but to recognize we can set ourselves free. We don't need anyone else's cooperation to do that. Yeah, there was there was a part I was getting to, I think the like the third quarter of the book, and I started feeling like and this is like it was a very young feeling, but sort of like, I don't know if you ever had like superhero fantasies, like, you know, you could fly or bend <laughs> steel or be invisible. And I started getting this superhero fantasy about like conflict resolution, dude. Like, you know, because because the, the, when you talk, you know, I think it was the chapter about like breaking patterns, like doing something unexpected. And like, boy, if I could get good at that, like. I could change the world. It's, it's it was so exciting. Yeah, you you can actually, and I've seen people do, and I've seen myself do that. I mean, it is amazing. I, I don't know if you've already experienced yourself breaking those patterns, but when you do, it is the most freeing experience in the world. And I've so I've I've done it myself, and I've also watched hundreds and hundreds of students and clients go through this process. And even just when the light bulb goes off and they haven't even taken action yet, but you know, you see the transformation in a person's physique in the way 
they look. So one minute they could be scribbling, you know, furiously writing out their conflict map and showing who all the people are that are involved. And then all of a sudden from doing that practice, a light bulb goes off in their mind. And all of a sudden, you know, you see their whole body just relax and a furrowed brow becomes kind of smooth. And there's this frown and, and seriousness that turns into more of a relaxed smile. Uh, and it's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing to witness. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to get into all my curiosity questions, but I'm going to start with something that uh, I'm not curious about because I know, but I want the audience to know, how did you get into this field? What's, what's, what drove you to be so interested in conflict? Well, as with most stories in life, <laughs> it all begins in childhood. So I was born into a family of, of door slammers and screamers. And so I learned from a very young age how to that I, I mean, I had to deal with conflict. I had to learn how to be okay with it and kind of saw myself as being in the eye of the storm and learning how to, how to manage myself through that. So that was, you know, one side of my family really is, is that brings that high conflict side. That's my, my grandfather. He was a immigrant to New York after many years of um, fleeing Nazi Europe and it was only as an adult that I realized that a lot of the anger and the rage that he had and experienced and, and I grew up with as a child may have come from the fact that he had this grief from losing his father and his one of his brothers who he never saw again once he left. They, they died, they were killed uh, in the war. And um, so he had this, this unexpressed grief that came out as anger and is now in multi-generational in my family. Um, and on the other side of my family was Grandma Florence, my mom's mom, who was what I call now the quintessential, the first conflict whisperer who I knew. She could just be with the rest of us. So we would drive every Sunday from our house, our, our apartment in the Bronx and drive out to the countryside to see my aunt and uncle in Connecticut. And she would sit in the back seat between me and my brother and my parents were in the front and, you know, she'd be, we'd all screaming every which way. And she would just have to say, sha, sha, quiet, quiet, in her Yiddish way. And we would all just calm down. And then she would tell me and my brother a story. So it was really from growing up in this environment where there was so much conflict. And then yet there was this role model of how to be a conflict whisperer and help people just by your very presence to calm themselves that I think I learned how to calm myself, how to help other people calm themselves. And so, you know, my work is born out of that. And then of course, you know, in college, I studied conflict. I went to go study in Jerusalem as you did um, in the mid nineties when peace agreements were being made between Israel and, and uh, Jordan and other, other, and the PLO uh, peace, the, the road to peace look, was looking hopeful at that point. Um, and then I went on to grad school and studied intractable conflict. Um, and so, uh, and now I've been working in the field for 20 years, started out at the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School and uh, continued on my journey from there. Yeah, I am, I am curious about how, because I have a, you know, a very similar background. I also had, you know, my, my mother escaped Austria in 1938 via kinder transport. And like as a child, the propaganda that I got from my parents was that we had a perfect family. <laughs> like we were the only normal ones. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> looking back, it was, you know, it's, it's laughable in that, you know, my father's conflict style outside the home, he was a, a labor organizer and a politician. And he, you know, I, I witnessed him get into fist fights and, you know, he was on picket lines and yelling and screaming. And, and he would finish, you know, he'd finish that and then, come, you know, like, be totally fine. Like there was nothing, there was no residual anything. Wow. But, it, but at home, any conflict was met with the silent treatment for up to a week. Mm -hmm. And he would get ulcers and be, I could hear him behind his bedroom door, like writhing on the bed in, with the ulcer that I caused by arguing with my mother. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and my mother was like mad at the world. 
Right. Because when she, you know, when she was 14 years old, she went to school one day and was told she was no longer welcome there. And every, all the classmates and teachers were wearing uh, swastikas. Wow. Like, you know, so like the, the rage that I saw that I never saw as a child that was mm -hmm. was sort of in there, it mm -hmm. it made me not want to study conflict. It made mm -hmm. it made me um, want to sort of be Grandma Florence on steroids. Mm -hmm. And and, of, you know, and I don't know Grandma Florence, but I don't know if she was whispering conflict or Res, you know, resolving it or just kind of like mm. damping it down. I'm curious, like what, was there anything like in your, as you grew up that was like, I need to fix this or I need, I'm out of control or I'm, I'm powerless. Like what were the internal? Yeah, right. These are such great questions and, and so great that you can look back on your story and try to figure it out. I mean, I, I hear you kind of searching around trying to figure it out and so many of us i mean people we go to our graves without ever having reflected on these questions of how i grew up and what did it mean that there was this history and this trauma in my family but yet no one ever talked about it so a, a few um commonalities that i hear in my story and your story well obviously i mean both of our stories involve members close members of our family you know your mother my grandfather and my grandmother fleeing from being you know someone who wanted to kill them and if that you know so that that's that's a quite traumatic experience the the snapshot you just gave us of your mother being told she's no longer welcome at school and then presumably shortly thereafter being put on a train and i assume never seeing many members of her family again. I mean, that's incredibly traumatic. So the idea that that traumatic experience that she went through would not somehow uh, land in your lap as her child to have to work through and deal with, you know, the, the, of course it's going to, particularly if she was never given the opportunity or never had the opportunity to explore what happened to her herself. That's, you know, this is my opinion as an organizational psychologist that until and unless we consciously uh, raise up for ourselves and explore what has happened to us, particularly when we've gone through traumatic experiences, it makes it very hard for us to, to, to deal with life in a, in a productive way. And I think that's what you and I are both looking at of you know, your mother and my grandfather didn't, ha it sounds like, did not have the opportunity to uh, work through that rage that would come from my entire life. My grandfather is 28 years old, you know, not that much, uh, double the age of your mom, but not that much older, you know, at those, particularly at a young age to go through what they went through, um, would have been helpful for them to then land here in America and, and have the opportunity to work through it. But in my case, he never did. And the way he worked through it <laughs> was not exactly, not what I would really call working through it, but was to, to, have, to, to express that rage in ways that made very little sense to the other people around him, right? So if we, you know, my brother and I were once playing with uh, my grandmother's yardstick, she was a seamstress, and one of us hit the light fixture and it broke. And I will never forget you know, the, the rage, my grandfather stormed out of his room. He must've heard the thing shatter and he stormed out of the room he was in and what's going on, you know, just so incredibly frightening um, for a young child. Uh, thankfully, you know, he never, he never laid a hand on either one of us, but so the main message <laughs> is uh, when there's this unexplored rage, it then comes out in ways that can be very hard for other people to deal with, particularly for us as we were young children. Um, and I think one one way to handle it is is to say they weren't able to do their work on it, but what work can I do? How can I explore what that trauma was for them and the impact that it had on me? Hmm. And now I don't even remember exactly the question that you asked <laughs> or whether I answered it or not. Oh, it doesn't matter <laughs> either. Um... I mean, one, th one thing that comes up for me, though, is that um, expressing rage is a conflict um, approach 
that only certain people are privileged to be able to do in the world, right? Because it, it, doing that requires power, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, the boss man can scream at everybody, but, you know, the underling can't. Mm -hmm. You know, men seem to be on average more comfortable breaking things than, than women. Mm -hmm. um, I feel extremely sort of on the feminine scale in terms of how I have approached uh, conflict until I get triggered to the point where, you know, I'm out of control. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, it's just because you talk about at the beginning of the book, you talk about this idea of the conflict loop. Mm -hmm. um, and it feels like, you know, it's, it's like a multi-generational <laughs> yeah. loop. Can you talk about the conflict loop? I guess well, let's, you know, let's probably move to practicality so we can like help people the way your book has helped me. What do you mean by a conflict loop in terms of a, a specific conflict? A conflict loop refers to each person involved in a situation has what I call a conflict habit. It's your primary way of dealing with conflict. So for example, you just gave us a great example in your family growing up, it sounds to me like a conflict habit was to avoid conflict or in, in my book, I talk about that as shutting down in the face of conflict. If you do that over and over and over again, you know, over time, avoid, 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 avoid leads to, you know, you're just shut down. Um, so that's one of the conflict habits in the book. Another one is in my family with the, the, how the yelling came out was I blame you and then you blame me back. So blame, 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 blame the other, blame the other. Another one of the conflict habits that I talk about that I think is, is much more rare. People don't typically talk about this as a conflict habit, but it is, I call it blame and shame yourself. So where for some of us, it's quite natural to blame outside of ourselves and blame the other people or person involved um, or even blame the situation. Uh, some of us take it internally and we, we shame ourselves. Um, and then finally, uh, others of us, and this one is particularly uh, even less, even more counterintuitive, some of us relentlessly seek to collaborate. So in this world over the last 40 years where collaboration has become the, the catch-all for, you know, this is the way we work, this is the way we do things, we have open offices, we must always, um, you know, work with other people to get things done. And so some of us have gotten so have been brought up in this world where we must we see ourselves as we must collaborate at all costs. And so what that can lead to is a loss of um, energy, time, resources. Well, we're sinking all of this into trying to work something out with someone else who's just not interested in working with us. Uh, so each of these four habits can be useful, right? It can be useful to avoid a situation, for example, when you don't you're not that invested in who the other people are, you don't care that much about the outcome, fine, you can avoid. But if you're consistently avoiding, like you described in your family, it can lead to, you know, unexpressed, un unexplored trauma and um, not helpful outcomes for anyone involved. So the conflict loop is looking at what's my conflict habit what's the other person or people's conflict habits and how do those get locked in a pattern of interaction that keeps us stuck on this conflict loop? So in my family growing up, it was blame, blame, and that's how we got stuck. Um, in your so, family- so In other words, when I, when I hear myself being blamed by you, mm -hmm. I'm going to respond in kind, which means you're gonna escalate. So it, it, it yeah. feed, it, the, the, the two patterns feed on each other to, to prolong and intensify the conflict. Right, the, I would say the two habits lock together to form this pattern. It's, it's called blame, 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 right? <laughs> Until or unless someone does something different. And that's what's pattern breaking, what I call pattern breaking action. Until somebody, one of these people involved in this blame, blame pattern, like Grandma Florence says, sha, sha right? My brother and I, my mom and my dad were all blaming, blaming, blaming. And then Grandma Florence says, sha, sha. and she can break that pattern for the moment, right? Um, I talk about also the, the pattern breaking path because Grandma Florence would do one pattern breaking action. It was effective in the moment in that car ride, but then the same pattern would repeat itself every single Sunday, right? Because there was something that needed to be done where, uh, somebody needed to build a, a, a pattern breaking path, right? Action that builds upon action that builds upon action that takes us out of this conflict loop 
towards an optimal outcomes loop, towards a more self-reinforcing virtuous cycle. Okay. So how, how does, um, you know, shutting down, you think that that would stop the conflict, right? How does that right. perpetuate it? Well, it just drives it underground until something explodes, right? So if we just, I, I hope you don't mind, I keep coming, it's a, it's, a, it's a helpful, clear example in my mind of your family. I hope you don't mind if we go back to it. <laughs> I brought them up. <laughs> so they're, if they're, you're- they're both, they're both gone, so. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully they're not, they're, they're appreciating that we're, we're working through stuff on their behalf for the good of the world. Um, so when one person's shutdown habit interacts with another person's shutdown habit, they're in this shutdown, shutdown cycle. And what that typically means is that if they have something that they disagree about, no one's talking about it. And so it kind of goes undercover until something happens where something gets inflamed and then boom, you know, there's a, there's a blip on the screen there where that goes, shoots up. Uh, and then it, something, somebody deals with it some way. Usually one person will, will stay shut down. The other person will do something, take some action there, and then it'll go back down undercover. And, you know, it's just bubbling beneath the surface until at some point it, it explodes. Now, if you and I are dealing with a conflict and I'm my, I've got my blame default habit and you've got your shutdown default habit, we get locked in, I blame you and you run away or you hide. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I never have any, I, I, it's very hard for me to find out what's going on for you because you don't want to talk to me about it. Um, and it's very hard for you to give me feedback that what I'm doing really is a problem and irritates you because you don't want to talk about that. It's too difficult. So, so that's, so we'll stay stuck like that until or unless one of us says to ourselves, I'd like to free myself and therefore the other person from this loop. So I'm gonna do something different that would either for, for you, that would obviously require you doing something other than hiding. And for me, that would require me doing something other than blaming you for what's happening. Yeah, see, when I hear you say that, I mean, like the part of my brain that wants to, that wants to see me as a good person, like we're not, we're not in conflict, we've never been in conflict. And yet I'm like, oh, um, but, I have no power here because Jen is the one who is like yelling. Like every time I try to bring it up, she screams at me. Okay, Jen, you're always right. Forget about it. I'm done. I'm walking away. Yeah. And I'm by not taking responsibility for my shutdown, mm -hmm. right? Or let's say yeah. one day I didn't shut down and it got worse, right? From my perspective mm -hmm. as a, as right. a conflict averse person. Mm -hmm. So, so it takes a lot of work for, for people to be able to say, I'm contributing to this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as you know, I, I try to, I do address that in the book. I hope I, I hope I did that well enough. And I say, you know, this book, th this work is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> so this book is for people who really, I mean, I think about this as the opposite of conflict 101. This is like, you are at the end of your rope. You have been dealing with something that's been going around and around and around and around, maybe for years, maybe for decades. Um, and you have feel like you have tried everything. You have tried to collaborate. You have tried to shut down and avoid. You, you, know, you've, you feel like you've tried everything and nothing has worked. That's who this methodology is designed to help. Because I came to it from a place of, you know, I was teaching the getting to yes methodology that comes out of um, the great work of Roger Fisher and his colleagues at Harvard Law School at the program of negotiation. And I was going around teaching this methodology and I saw that it worked a good percentage of the time, but sometimes it didn't. There were situations that were just in my mind so far gone that teaching people how to use principled win-win negotiation skills just didn't fly. It just didn't work. So this this is really meant for what do you do when you feel stuck? And yes, so it's not for the faint of heart. It's really for people who you feel like your back's up against the wall. You got to do something else. And I do like how you, you mentioned, well, if I typically shut down, maybe then I try to like stay in there and do something. Well, that would be pattern breaking. And if it doesn't work, the next thing is just experiment with something else, right? In the book, we talk about doing mini experiments and seeing what works. 
do something small, specific, you see what the impact is, if it's getting you the impact that you want, the outcomes that you desire, and you need, of course, to, you know, there's a whole piece of work to be done about what is it that I actually want to achieve here. I think, anyway, I, I could go on and on and on, but so often we, yeah. well, you we think we want it. one thing. The tiger, right? If you're being chased by a tiger, you can't focus on anything but the tiger. Mm -hmm. And right. So if you're in the conflict loop, the best I could say is I want to win. Right. I want to be right. I want to I want to um, get my way or I want the conflict to stop. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so but, you know, we don't think in terms of like this conflict is an opportunity to grow a relationship. It's an opportunity for me to grow myself. Mm -hmm. Like it's so hard on our own to think yeah. about like, what do I really, really want here? Right. Like, what would be good here? Like what would be, dare I say, an optimal outcome? Yes, right, exactly. I couldn't have said it better than the way that you just did. And as you know, I love, I've been teaching for years um, in my course at Columbia showing a video clip of just a few minutes of Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, because it is just a beautiful, beautiful example of what I wish for all of us that we can do when we're in conflict situations. So what we learn when we're in grade school about in America about the power of that speech, I have a dream, is, is the repetition of the words, I have a dream, I have a dream. And, and that's kind of as far as, the, as, for me at least, growing up in public schools in New York City, that's what we learned, right? That he used this repetition. Um, but if you really listen to the words in a deeper way that Dr. King used, he drew, paints a picture for us, but not only with images, he also uses language that helps us hear what the future is. So he's painting a picture of what he wants the future to look like. And he talks about the bells of freedom ringing. He talks about the sands of um, the sands shifting. Um, there's a lot of really amazing imagery that makes use of the five senses. So you can feel it. He talks about boys and girls, black boys and, and white girls holding hands with each other. So you can feel the skin of the holding of the hands. He uses all five senses to help us imagine that future that he wants for us. And that is what I hope we can all do for ourselves. So instead of just knowing in our gut that we want this situation to go away or we wanna put an end to it or we wish it was done or we wish we could be free from it, let's get really specific. What exactly do I want this future to look like? That's not easy. It's not as easy as it, as it might sound, but we can use Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech as a, an, as a great example. Mm -hmm. and, and your book offers wonderful prompts in, in that chapter for sort of writing about, um, you know, to use your imagination, right? Yeah. That's, a, that's an important element. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I, one thing on the imagination distinction, I talk about it as using your imagination because if your brain, if your thinking brain could solve this situation and you've been working for years and years and years to do it, or even for months or even weeks, your brain probably would have figured it out right by now, right? If you've learned all the best win-win negotiation methodologies and that's not working, well, let's see if we could put the rational thinking brain aside for a moment and engage the imagination instead and really close your eyes, imagine what could that future look like. Right. And, and in a very, you know, encourage sort of in a very sort of hypothetical free way, right? Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. you know, by definition, I mean, you know, I, um, in coaching and helping people, we never know where it's going to go, right? right? When, you, when you engage in conflict resolution, like you literally don't know, like we might think, oh, here's how I want it to end. Mm -hmm. But if it works, it's, it's almost certainly going to work in a way that you could never have predicted. Yes, absolutely. That is typically what happens for people using this, these practices, these eight practices of the optimal outcomes method. So what you're saying is so important. And the way that I work with that with these practices is one of the practices is what we were just talking about is imagine for yourself what in your most ideal life in the future, what would you like to see happen? Once you're 
done with that, you've done a robust piece of work on imagining the future you would like to see, only then your work is to ask yourself, now what's realistic? So I, I, I talk about an optimal outcome as along two dimensions. One is what, what would I love to see that we've just talked about? And then the other dimension is what's realistic given the situation and the constraints of the situation, who the other people are who are involved and really needing, you know, this requires you not, so before we were talking about knowing who I am, right? Doing some self-reflection and acknowledging I might have contributed to the situation in ways I'm not proud of. Well, this next piece of looking at the reality of what you're dealing with and who you're dealing with requires you to really look at the other person for who they have shown themselves to be, right? What are the actions that they have taken? What are the words that they have said? And, and look at that squarely and say, okay, I am dealing with someone who has done X, not someone who I wish they were like this or that. Right, but who they really have shown themselves to be. And then also what we've talked about already, the reality of who I myself am with all my own strengths and my own limitations as well. So an optimal outcome is what I can imagine, like we were talking about, and taking into account reality. And that's ultimately where we get to what, what is the optimal outcome here, something that, that fits reality as well. Because if we don't take into account reality, we're just often in dreamland. And I write a, a lot about that in the book as well what it means to fantasize about something that may never actually happen. It's just a, a waste of time and energy as far as I'm concerned. Right, although I think, you know, for, in my experience, my, uh, I limit reality <laughs> far more than I think I do, right? Mm -hmm. Because I've, because of the, you know, I, I, I've seen them at their worst, right? So it's hard for me to imagine, like, you know, the, um, one of the things you talk about is sort of, if the other person were acting in good faith, mm -hmm. what might be the reasons for what they're doing? What might they want that's actually positive instead of turning them into a, you know, a, a movie villain? Yes, yes, absolutely. Right, so I don't, I, I, I do wanna caveat what I said before about taking reality into account. We don't want to um, do what you said. We don't wanna limit our thinking about who the other people are. So that's why, so, you know, what you're really pointing to is that there are eight, practices in this methodology, and many of them balance one another out. So the one that I was just talking about comes towards the end of the book. So if we do them in, and I think it is, can make sense to do them in sequential order. So by the end of the process, you're saying, let me remind myself exactly who am I dealing with? What have they done? But towards the middle of the process, you're looking at what might be driving their behavior that would lead them to do the things or say the things that they have done that I, that I, that they can't even speak themselves because they've driven it down underneath their conscious awareness. Like for example, um, if somebody, yeah, one of the examples uh, that I, I use a lot is about Bob and Sally who are in conflict with one another. He's the CEO, she's his top salesperson and He's saying she's so greedy, all she cares about is her own compensation and I need to get it in line with the rest of the industry standards and also, you know, it's just not working for the company. She's being paid way out of whack with what everyone else here is making and I need to bring her salary down. And she's saying, no way, man. You know, I, I'm responsible for so much of the success of this company. How dare you? I'm not even gonna talk about it with you. And she storms out and every time he tries to bring up this, topic, the same exact pattern happens. She, she perceives him to be blaming her and she goes and, and hides and they don't talk for months after that. And so, uh, oh gosh, what is my point? <laughs> where, where were we headed? Talking about like the, what's the, the value underlying? Like what, oh, what, right. Exactly. Is she, Thank is, she, you. is she just greedy? Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. So is she just greedy? So when I was working with Bob, I said to him, what do you know about Sally, about her background, how she grew up, her history, who she is as a person? What do you know about her that she may not even know or be able to admit about herself that might be driving some of this behavior? And he's pretty quickly says, well, you know, I met her dad a few times. She's you, you know, she's told me over the years, they, they had been good friends. She's told me over the years that she grew up in a very poor family. She had to learn how to survive as a child without heat, 
without enough heat in the winter, without enough food on the table. And so it could be, Bob says, that even though today she's making more than anyone else in this company, including me as CEO, it could be that she's just really nervous about her financial security in life and that nothing I can do or say is going to take away that fear that she has. And I'm not happy about it, he said, but I can acknowledge that this may be driving her behavior, this past experience, this way she grew up. And I said, yeah, you're right, Bob. You know, it may be. And it may be so difficult for her to talk about because it's not something she's proud of. It's not something maybe she's ever really worked through. And it's coming out in this way where she just shuts down and, and is unwilling to talk about it. So even without him raising that question explicitly with her of, is this why, you know, he didn't, I, I would not have advised him and I didn't advise him and I wouldn't advise most people to go, you don't have to bring that person's, what I'm calling that a shadow value, right? Financial security is a shadow value for Sally because it's driving her behavior, but she's not consciously aware that that's what's happening for her. He doesn't need to talk about that with her in order to have some empathy for her, understand what's driving her behavior, and then work with it himself to see, okay, how can I work with Sally given that this may be a really tough, this is what's driving her. This is going to be really tough for her. This is not just, she doesn't want to talk about her compensation. This is, this gets to a fundamental aspect of who she is, of her identity. Yeah, this is, this feels like it's a lot of my personal work these days and just in, not in individual conflicts, but sort of, you know, politically, socially, that it's very easy for me. And I think probably for a lot of people on Facebook, Twitter, to demonize the people we disagree with, mm -hmm. right? To, to dehumanize them. So, you know, I'm mm -hmm. very left-wing progressive. So, you know, billionaires, cops, there's, there's all these groups that I see meme after meme, um, you know, really not seeing them as, as having any redeeming qualities, as, as having no positive motivations. And it's, it almost feels like a betrayal to not go, you know, to like it and po repost it and like, you know, all cops are bastards and eat the rich and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, and yet I, I also know, first of all, it's not doing any good, you know, it's an echo chamber. And second, that by not, by not understanding what's motivating people and having that empathy, even for billionaires, even for um, insurrectionists, mm -hmm. right? Even for anti-Semites, without having some understanding of what they're afraid of or what they want, um, the only uh, the only option of conflict resolution is superior force. Mm -hmm. And especially, and, and so if I, if I need superior force to go against cops and billionaires, I'm screwed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what you're saying is very very powerful because even you're talking about even the most challenging people for you in your life are ones who are worthy maybe not even be in and of themselves i mean i do hear you saying you, you didn't say this but if i read through the lines of what you've said i might suggest because they're human they are worthy of at least inquiry into what might be driving their behavior. That's one reason why it's worthy to do that inquiry. And a more maybe practical reason to do it is that to the extent that you can understand what's driving their behavior, you are more likely to be able to work with them or uh, get what you want and need out of a conversation with them or out of any kind of interaction with them than if you don't do that inquiry. Yeah, yeah, I just, I just watching a, um, a documentary on Apple TV called 1971. It's a great show. It's all about the music that was made in 1971 in a mm -hmm. cultural, political, social context. And the first episode is about the Vietnam War and it's showing all these protesters and it has all the Nixon tapes. And you hear Nixon talking very, very candidly. He never thought these were gonna be released to the public. And 
you can see that like just that he does have a positive goal in in fighting this horrible war mm. that you know and he views the wow. protesters as as children who don't understand the world and he's defending america against communism mm. and you know it then goes to like he's trying to convince kissinger to let him drop a, an atomic bomb it, like wow. but you can see these two these two groups with nothing but disdain for each other mm -hmm. and how it leads to a shooting at Kent State and how it leads to the, each side becoming ridiculous in right. a way right? <laughs> because, yeah. they, because they can't see any humanity in the other. Right. What you're describing is sounds like for you yourself, just watching this, this movie, um, you gained a, a, an, an amount of, you gained some empathy for Nixon that you couldn't, you didn't maybe have before, you heard his words in more depth than you had before. And so it doesn't mean you need to stop there and say, oh, wow, I guess he was right, right? I don't hear you saying that. <laughs> the empathy can at least help you understand why the other person may be doing what they're doing, and then helps you strategize, what can I do to move this situation forward or shift this situation in a way, given that I can understand that. Right? Even acknowledging, like, you know, Nixon is a little kid, right? right. Emotionally. Right. We think, you know, most yeah. powerful man in the world. Yeah. But there was an incredible scene where he's, he's, uh, he, he introduces the Ray Conniff singers, which is this group of like, you know, look like debutantes, like the, the, the most Republican conservative square music you could imagine. And he introduces them and said, I like square music. And one of these, you know, um, beautiful, like willowy blonde women who in a, in a pink ball gown, who's about to sing to him, holds up a sign saying, stop the bombing. And she, she like cusses him out essentially and saying, if Jesus were here, you wouldn't be bombing, you know, telling him he's a bad person. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see this, the rictus of a smile on his face as he's, he's, you know, dreaming of like throttling her. Mm -hmm. and, like, it, you know, he's just a person, like to say to him, boy, I really appreciate how hard you're working to keep America safe. Yeah. Can we talk about whether that's working? Right. Like or, if anyone had right. said that, you can see right. like, like something would have cracked. Right. So there right. would have been an opening. Right. And also, maybe the woman in the pink ball gown also wants to keep America safe. Most likely she does, right? It's a matter, so they may share, in my language, they, they may share an ideal value of safety or of national security and national freedom. What they disagree on is how to do that. And so if they could engage in a conversation about what's the best way to keep America safe or what are the best ways to keep America safe, that might be a more, potentially more fruitful conversation than this is, you know, you're right, I'm wrong. No, I'm right, you're wrong. Mm. Yeah, so I, I kind of, I want to skip the mapping because it seems complicated to talk about and people should get the book and then they can go through it. But I do want to dive into this idea of the values, the shared values, the, sh the shadow values. To me, that is, it's such a, it's such a beautiful piece of work um, because on, on almost every case, like, humans have the same basic values, mostly, like we want the same things. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like the conf because the, con the conflict becomes much larger than the thing the conflict was originally about. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and, and so like the, we could have solved the conflict very easily when it, when it started, mm -hmm. had we said, well, what do we, what do we both care about here? Mm -hmm. And are they, and, and are they both valid? Mm -hmm. So can you, can you talk about like how you think about values? And yeah. How this. Yeah, absolutely. So there's one, there's a bunch of different ways to talk and think about values. One of them is what you, I think maybe the more obvious way is what you just started to talk about, which is so often underlying, and this, you know, this, this comes out of, um, this kind of takes a little bit deeper, the work of the Getting to Yes uh, Harvard Negotiation Project methodology that Roger Fisher and his colleagues created over 40 years ago, they said, when people are saying yes, no, yes, no, those are their positions. I want the window open, I want the window closed. But if you get underneath those positions, well, why do you want the window open? Oh, because I'm hot and I would like a breeze. Why do you want the window closed? Because I'm cold and I would 
I would like to be warmer, right? So now we understand a little bit about what they want. Well, maybe we can put a fan over by the person, you know, or separate them and have them sit in different places. <laughs> um, now we understand more, there's lots more options for how we could solve that dilemma or that conflict. Looking at what are the, the values that we hold, these are kind of a level deeper than even what our interests are, why we want what we want. This is, what do I believe? What's my worldview? What do I believe about myself? What do I believe about the world? What is the most important driving factors for me, many of which I have never explicitly recognized, right? So I have on my desk a list of six values because <laughs> values are really, you know, this is my work. <laughs> this is, I wrote a whole book about how to use values to help ourselves uh, thrive in the world. So are um, those your values? These are my values. So I've got healthy living, spirituality, love, adventure, leadership, and making the world a better place. These are the values that in my ideal concept of myself, my identity, and my world, this is what I would like to drive my behavior. So I have it right front and center. I, lo so that I, love, I love that those are your values. And I also love that you feel the need to like have them in your face. Like it's so, it's, it's so easy to go through years untethered from them. Yeah, absolutely, exactly. We have no idea what they are. So how do we know what we really want, right? So a great way to know if you're, if you're someone listening to this and you're struggling with a, a conflict situation and we were talking about, ask yourself, what would, Mar Mar you know, how, what would my I have a dream speech be? And you say to yourself, I have no idea. Well, maybe a good first step is to ask yourself, if I had to, you know, choose my top three values in life, what would they be? And, and in the book and also on, on the website at optimaloutcomesbook.com, there's a whole ton of resources that people can download. And one of those is a list of about a, a few dozen, maybe a hundred um, values so that you don't have to start from scratch and you can and there are instructions on that PDF that will walk you through and also in the book that will walk you through how can you identify what your ideal values are. So if you know what your ideal values are and you can ask someone else, also you can have other, you know, have a group of people or have another person who you're involved in a conflict situation with do this exercise too. You can see, oh, one reason why we might not be seeing eye to eye here is actually that, you know, I have a value of healthy living and you have a value of ease. And so sometimes my value of healthy living is leading me to say, we got to exercise, you know, 6 a.m. every morning, no matter what. And you're saying, but I want an easeful life. And therefore, you know, I'd rather sleep in when I'm tired. And so we could see what might be driving that conflict for us. But other times, like we were talking about before, we could both share an underlying value of security or freedom or American safety and still disagree on how to get that done. So this is one side of the values story. But the reason why I call these ideal values is because if you ask me, I'm more than happy, right? How proud was I to tell you what my list of values are? <laughs> Very. Right, but, no, no, nothing about torturing kittens or... <laughs> but if I ask you or you ask me, Jen, what are your shadow values? that's a little harder for me to answer. And that's not something I'm so proud of, right? Those are things that I really care about in life, but I am not proud to say that I care about, right? For me, those might be things like recognition, um, attention, um, getting empathy from other people, um, status, power, control, right? Mm -hmm. So many of us share those shadow values, and then and 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 to be clear, they're they're yeah. not shadow values because they're inherently bad, but right. because you don't want to cop to them. Right, exactly. Right? So, I'm too I'm, I'm too pure. I'm too altruistic to care about whether uh, I'm on the bestseller list. Right. right, 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 exactly. These are things that I am really ashamed. Uh, that I am, am I someone who values control? No, I don't, I don't, I don't want to control everything. And yet, you know, everything has to be in exactly the right place. If you ask my kids, does mommy care about control? Absolutely. Right. I need everything to be in its place. And so when I can't put language to that and I 
will not admit that I care about control, it becomes extra hard for me to be in relationship with other people because they might be saying, why are you such a control freak? And then that really, you know, kills me. And, but I don't see it. It hurts so much because at some level, very deep down in my consciousness, uh, I know that I, that they're right. And that's why it hurts. And yet I'm so ashamed of this that I, I am not willing to admit it. So that's why, um, but if you know that I am a control freak, <laughs> I really care about control. Well, if we've been having some issues, some conflict, you could do things. You, Howie, could do something. You could do things to help ease my sense and need for control, even without talking to me about it. You don't have to walk up to me and say, Jen, I think you really care a lot about control. You could just say, you know what? Jen's my friend. I get that she really wants things in, in their place. And I'm going to, as a gift to her, just put the thing back when I, you know, I took the stapler, I'm going to put it back where I know she likes it so that I care about her. Or you could say, you know what? I'm going to, I am going to talk about it with her because this is really, you know, bothering me. I have to put everything back in exactly the right place. And that is not healthy for her. It's not healthy for us. So like, maybe I do want to raise it. If we have that level of trust, maybe you could talk about it with me. There's ways you can work with it, or you could do neither of those things. And you could just know it for yourself that this is going to be, you know, if I put the stapler back in the wrong place, Jen's going to flip out. And like, I don't have to then flip out because I know it's predictable. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And, and one of the things I really like about this is that it gives us permission to have those values, mm -hmm. right? Like when I'm reading about it in the book, it's like, oh, like a desire for status like some people are very happy and proud of like, I want to be rich. I want to be the world's richest person. All right. right. I, I want to be a success. I want adulation and fame. Mm -hmm. um, or what, you know, that all of these, I mean, if we look at it from sort of an evolutionary perspective, they're all sort of, you know, designed to help us survive, increase the odds of survival and reproduction. They're very, they're very human. But for me to be able to, to think about shadow values and accept my own and be compassionate with myself. Like, well, maybe, maybe I would prefer not to feel so egotistical, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, I really like it when people say, oh, Howie, you're so smart. <laughs> like, and, and, and I do, you know, and when I, when I don't acknowledge that, I start doing all sorts of little things that leak the desire to get that as opposed to, being helpful and effective, which are which are real values. So I think the, the the exercise of thinking about like what are your what are somebody else's shadow values, and like being okay with them means that we can kind of accept all of ourselves, or at least yeah. more of ourselves. Yeah, right. And you're you're talking about a couple of different ways we can work with shadow values. One way is we can work with them when we can acknowledge what someone else's shadow value might be even though it may be completely taboo and unhelpful even to talk about it with them. And then the other way we can use shadow values is to acknowledge for ourselves, to have compassion for ourselves. And absolutely, you're right that uh, one person's shadow values can be someone else's ideal values and vice versa. So I used to do this uh, exercise this part of this practice in a way where I'd have everyone, uh, when I was teaching this course at Columbia, I'd have everyone go up to the board and, and anonymously write on big flip chart papers, shadow values and ideal values. And then we would all take a step back and look at patterns and see you know, what, what patterns can we see emerging from these lists. And of course, you know, one of the most striking ones that I always remember is that love showed up on both lists. And, and we got to ask questions, you know, you were allowed to ask questions. And if people didn't feel comfortable answering because they wanted to remain anonymous, they would, didn't have to answer the question. But one person said, I put love on the ideal list, but I see someone else put love on the shadow value list. And I don't understand that. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Can, if someone who wrote love on the shadow values list would feel comfortable explaining what that means to them and why they put that there, it would be really enlightening for me. And the person did come forward and said, in my family growing up, we were not allowed to talk about love. We were not about allowed to express love. My, my parents 
just didn't, my father in particular, just did not show or express his love for me. And so that is a shadow value. I really do care about love, but I'm not allowed to let anyone know that I care about it. Mm-hmm. And it was just so enlightening for, for, for the whole group. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I really found helpful in your discussion of shadow values is the fact that we can respond to them in extremes that are opposites, hmm. right? That I can, you know, the shadow value of, um, you know, let's say financial success mm-hmm. can, or, you know, can lead me to become extremely predatory and greedy. Mm-hmm. It could also lead me to be so ashamed of that that I never ask for what I'm worth and I struggle financially. Yeah, right, absolutely. Right. If right, and I, you know, you could probably do a whole research study and really think more deeply about that. Why that is the case? Um, Trying to think about whether I have any hypotheses, working hypotheses on that of why, if if two people have the same shadow value, um, let's say a shadow value of recognition, wanting to be recognized, and one person will want so badly to be recognized that it'll ooze out of them in all these ways of, you know, people will accuse them of brown nosing the boss and, um, uh, and, and another person will want that recognition, but just hide and just, you know, have a life where they are so not seeking any spotlight. Um, yeah, it's a very, it would be a really interesting question to explore what leads people to express or not express that or have it ooze out or really try to contain it. But it is true though, in my experience, that this is how these shadow values can show up in these very extreme ways. Yeah. So um, we're, we're coming up to the end of the time that uh, you said you, you had for me. I do, I do, if you have a couple more minutes, um, I would love to talk about the, this sure. like breaking the pattern and so give people sort of hope and maybe some like fun examples, like you have the, the wonderful, the beer summit example, mm-hmm. um, but just, you know, either political, you know, worldwide or just individual personal examples of what, what bre- the power of breaking the, pa- of breaking the pattern. Absolutely. Uh, let's think, well, you brought up the beer summit. It is such a great example. Um, maybe I'll, I'll give the high level overview. Uh, about the beer summit, which happened several years ago now when President Obama was president and Joe Biden was vice president. And there was a um, racial incident that occurred in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where a Harvard Law School professor who is black was accused of breaking into his own home. Someone called the police on him thinking that he was um, breaking into his home and it was his own home. And this was, this came at a time when there was already a lot of racial unrest in the country. And um, this, the, the chief of police in Cambridge, Massachusetts did and said some things that were seen to be inappropriate and um, there was major conflict. And Obama then in a press conference about healthcare said something, uh, I think he called the chief of police of the Cambridge police stupid. And this just exacerbated the situation even more. And so if you think about what were the options available to Obama in that situation, right? For many leaders, the White House staff might have gotten together and said, okay, we have, you know, let's create a task force on race. Let's, let's, you know, fly Obama to Cambridge and have him sit with the police chief and the Harvard Law School professor. Let's have him give a speech at Harvard Law School. There's so many things that they could have done that would have been very similar and kind of continued in the pattern of what had been done before that never really changed anything. Right, or he could have doubled down, right? And, and gotten kudos from, from lots of people in his base. Right. Right, exactly. He could have doubled down, gotten kudos from people in his base, and completely ostracized a whole other part of of American society by doing that. But he didn't do that. He didn't do any of that. Instead, what he did, which I think is just so brilliant because it is so pattern breaking, is he said, you know what, 
I'm going to invite the chief of police and the Harvard Law School professor to come to the White House. And we're going to sit and have some pretzels and some beer. And we're going to talk and just get to know each other as people. And that's what they did. And the journalists who covered the story were the ones who called it a beer summit. And Obama is quoted in the New York Times as having said, people, this is not a summit. This is a few people getting together on a lawn over a couple of beers and getting to know each other. And this New York Times article also quotes the sergeant and also the Harvard Law School professor as each saying this was a great way to get to know each other. And, and the Harvard Law School professor even said, um, you know, when you really get to know the sergeant, he's actually a really nice guy. <laughs> and so something that could have just continued to explode by doing something so simple. So that's, you know, the, the point about taking pattern breaking action is you want to do something that's simple, surprising, surprisingly different from what you've done before. And that's what Obama did. This was something very simple, start small and do something surprisingly different than you've done before. It will jolt other people out of that conflict loop as well when you do something that surprises them, right? So if, you, if you've been blame, 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 blaming someone else and then you issue an apology to someone, boy, I mean, that's like a classic example. It will just, you know, really uh, help open up that conflict loop. Right, and maybe we could finish with Bob and Sally because that's you have that uh, that story runs throughout the book. So, how, what was what was the pattern breaking action there? Yeah, well, Bob had to do some good internal work for himself, and you know one of the main issues that Sally had was that Bob kept catching her off guard, surprising her in, in not the way that we're talking about, but he kept trying to you know. Sort of ambush she felt like yeah yeah he would he would really ambush her um and talk try to talk to her about her compensation on a street corner in these informal ways and so what he did was he said you know what let's get together but first when we get together i i don't even want to talk about your compensation i just want to talk about our working relationship and where it got off track and how we might be able to help ourselves get back on track with each other and so that in and of itself was a pattern breaking move because they never talked about their relationship. They only talked about, you know, the task at hand or the, the thing, the issue at hand. So they talked about their relationship. And the language that he used was very strategically not blaming her, right? Yes. It was very, let's both look at this third thing, the, our mm -hmm. relationship. Yes. Where right. it got off track. Right, exactly. And what we can do. So it was, it was sort of knitting them together almost like the two of them against the conflict. Yes, yep, absolutely. And he asked her questions. He said, like, tell me what, you know, what's up for you in this? And she said, look, the things that have been the most hard for me are that you're catching me off guard and you're not giving me any warrant, you're talking to me in these informal settings. And also I, I have no idea about any of the numbers. Like you're not giving me any numbers to look at in advance or to think about. You're just asking me on the spot to make a commitment to you and I, I don't have any context. And so he said, all right, well, I am happy to send you a proposal in advance of how we'd like to restructure your compensation and also to do it in a formal meeting. Would that work for you? Yes, that would be great, she said. So they then had a second meeting where he sent her a proposal in advance. She had also asked him, could she understand the bigger picture of the company's financials? Because she wanted to see how what they were talking about doing for her fit into that. And of course, that was in his interest as well, because that was what was driving the whole need that he had in the first place was that what she was being paid was out of whack with what the rest of the company looked like from a financial standpoint. So he both presented to her the company's financials. He also presented to her his proposal for her. And at that point, it was like a no-brainer. I mean, she, she was fine with what he was proposing. It, it was not the content of what he was proposing that had been so challenging. It was the interactions that they had had around it that were the challenge. And so, you know, it was a very, very easy solve at that point um, once he was able to understand what it was that she really needed and wanted. Hmm. It's almost like the two in the in the habit loop. The two people are pushing against each other. That when one person just moves, there 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 has to be some sort of movement. Right. Exactly. I mean, they were in a blame shutdown. He was blame blame blaming her, and she was shutting down every time 
you know, it would be months that they wouldn't talk. And so when he took this pattern breaking action one after the other, which was, let me ask her to talk about our relationship first move. Second move, let me ask her some questions now that we're in the room together. He was not ask he had not been in the habit of asking her questions. He had been in the habit of delivering information to her and ambushing her with information that she didn't want to hear. So again, pattern breaking act number two. Number three was giving her the data in advance so she had time to think about it. Pattern breaking action number three. So it was just a a pat he built this pattern breaking path out of that conflict loop towards an optimal outcome that they eventually got to. Awesome. So while people are waiting for optimal outcomes to arrive after after they've ordered it, what's what do you think is like the one thing you would tell people to do if they're thinking about a conflict in their own life that's been longstanding, painful and intractable? What's the what's the while they're waiting for the rest of the instructions? What's what's one, you know, simple, maybe not easy, but simple, straightforward thing that you would recommend for people to do? Sure. I think the first thing to do is really ask yourself, what is my default conflict habit? How have I been acting? Have I been avoiding to the point where I shut down in the face of conflict? Do I typically blame other people? Do I typically blame and shame myself? Or do I typically seek to relentlessly collaborate with other people even when I'm not getting their cooperation in, in hand? Um, and an easy way people can do this is if they go to optimaloutcomesbook.com slash assessment, uh, you can take an assessment to find out. So if you're not sure which one of those four might be your default, you can go take the assessment online and find out which is your default conflict habit. And then once you know your habit, you know what would be pattern breaking for you, which is basically doing anything different from what you normally do, right? Uh -huh. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so interesting. Like there's 359 degrees of freedom. Exactly. And the th and, and and not doing that one degree that we've been doing can feel so hard. Um, exactly. So we bring some awareness and compassion to ourselves. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I do talk about it like if you, you, you know, 360 is really more appropriate, but if you think about it as 180 degrees, if you've always been going like this, you have all of these degrees and you have all of the, and we just want you to open it up a little, right? We just want you to test it out. And that's what mini experiments is all about. Just test it out, test it out, test it out. See, right. and then see what's the feedback. How did that go? What worked well? What would I do differently next time? Because I already know what I'm getting by doing the thing I've always done. Exactly. <laughs> right. So it's about engaging that curiosity. What would it be like if I did this other thing instead? Awesome. So, so people can find you at um, optimaloutcomesbook.com. Yes. If they go to slash assessment, they can take the assessment. Mm -hmm. um, you have a, um, a professional site um, with yeah. your, your full name. Yes, it's jengoldmanwetzler.com. W-E-T-Z-L-E-R. And it, it, optimaloutcomesbook.com and jengoldmanwetzler.com all go to the same place. Okay, great. Um, and I'm just curious what you have, um, research you're doing these days is most, are you mostly doing sort of, you know, consulting practice or are you still trying to answer questions? I'm deep in practice at the moment, really working with leaders and senior teams of organizations to help them implement everything that you and I have been talking about. Um, and on the horizon, what's the next thing? You know, the Israel-Palestine situation is always on my mind and looking at how can we bring these concepts and these ideas to help help that situation move forward in a productive way. Um, and 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 some 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 thinking about what is it, what is a, you know, we talk about microaggressions, looking at what does micro cooperations look like. These huh. things that are so difficult to pin down, but they happen all the time um, in the situations that where we least expect them. So thinking oh, about I, that idea. I love that concept. Well, Jen, thank you so much for writing this incredible book, which is the, the, the tip of the iceberg of a, of a long and thoughtful career already. And thank you so much for taking the time today. You too, Howie. Thank you so much as well. It's been really a delight to be in conversation with you as I knew it would be. Uh, thank you for your thoughtfulness and for your curiosity and, uh, and great questions and great, great insight as well.
a, to a total pleasure and honor. So take care. I'll talk to you again soon. Sounds great. All right. May all your conflicts be productive and may you find freedom from them and freedom within them. If you want to get Jen's book, you can just find it anywhere. Um, Optimal Outcomes is the name of the book. Her name again is Jen Goldman Wetzler. You can also take that assessment about your um, conflict habit style at optimaloutcomesbook.com slash assessment. You can also check out all the stuff at the show notes for this episode, plantyourself.com slash 470. So wrapping up in movement news, wrapping up my uh, eight week monkey bar gym challenge, um, feeling feeling stronger and I'm getting I'm getting feedback over the zoom that my form is improving. So I'm, I'm not quite ready to do hard running on hard surfaces yet, but I am adding um, sprints on grass. So I'm out there looking for a, a nice 3% graded hill where I can do some sprints and build up my stamina for that uh, July tournament. Um, garden news, blueberries are coming in, getting about mm, just a cup, cup and a half a day right now. And if you live in the area and you want some herbs, basil or um, holy basil or, or uh, peppermint, especially peppermint's gone wild, um, just uh, drop me a line and uh, come by and uh, forage, and glean to your to your heart's content. And a big thank you to everyone who volunteered for a coaching uh, session for me. I'm offering a, a couple of gratis coaching sessions to create demo content for the book that's uh, coming out in the fall. You can change other people. I can't get to everyone, but to thank the people who did sign up, um, I'll be holding a, a free webinar for all of you and we'll take as many sort of issues and questions um, as I can. And um, if you uh, want more than that, you'd like to work with me, uh, drop me a line hj at plantyourself.com. And uh, I do have very, I have a sliding scale for working with folks. And I think I'm moving to a, um, a three month program um, to see how that works out, to see if we can kind of cram a year's worth into three months without making it uh, feel rushed or, or overly onerous. Um, if you'd like to um, throw your hat in the ring and give that a try, just drop me a line again, hj at plantyourself.com.